Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the SR202203 uh, Fish Passage Project Lunch and Learn. My name is Kristen Anderson, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. We are recording this meeting, as you just heard, in an automated um, message as well. And that recording will be posted to the project web page in about a week. So a question is going to pop up on your screen. We'd love to hear about where you're participating from. Now, you know, I'll give just a few minutes there. Um, looks like there are quite a few, Carnation, Fall City, um, and about a quarter of you are from others. So welcome, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, another question is gonna pop up. We're interested to know about your familiarity with the Fish Passage Program. All right, I'll give it just a minute. There was, I got a funny little message there, but it looks like things are working now. Um, we have, great. Well, it looks like there's a, there, there, there's a real range. Some people are familiar and some people not at all. So thank you for joining us today. And we hope you walk away with a little more information and understanding of the program. Um, before we get started, we wanted to cover a few tips on how to use Zoom for those of you who maybe haven't used Zoom. If you'd like to use the closed captions, you can click on that live transcript bottom in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen and click on that and then click on show subtitles and that'll open the closed captions. All of you are muted, which we've done to reduce uh, background noise and improve everyone's experience. Uh, we won't be having participants use audio today. And if you're having any issues with the sound or the level of volume, you can click on the microphone button. It's kind of at the bottom left of your screen and adjust the volume. Use the chat button if you're having any other technical issues and our technical team will respond in the chat button and, and see how they can help you. You can also submit questions uh, throughout the presentation um, <clears throat> in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. That's different from the chat, it's, it's the Q&A button. And we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Olson with WashDOT to introduce the team we have here today. Okay, great, thank you so much, Kristen. I am Chris Olson. I am an assistant communications manager with WashDOT. I'm working on this particular project. We have quite a few members of our team here with us today, including Tim Now, he is the assistant project engineer for this project, and Ellen Shi, she is the project manager. And we also have some folks with our Fish Passage Program and Environmental um, Office. So during this Lunch and Learn, we are going to cover the following. WashDOT's Fish Passage Program, this project on SR202 and 203. We'll show you the existing conditions and why they're a problem. Um, we're going to show you a couple examples of fish passable structures. We'll talk about how this work may affect traffic. We'll review the project timeline. And then we'll give you information on how to stay up to date on this particular project. But we want to start by playing a video about the state's fish passage program and how it's making a difference. Fish streams that have become blocked when they intersect a state highway affect migrating salmon's ability to access the full extent of some waterways. Correcting these barriers is an important part of the state's effort to protect and restore salmon runs and meet legal requirements from the federal government. WashDOT's efforts to correct fish passage barriers is part of a larger restoration effort, making an important contribution to salmon and steelhead recovery in Washington state. WashDOT has been correcting fish passage barriers since the early 1990s and has made significant progress. Washington State has thousands of miles of streams that are home to salmon and other fish species. There are many crossings of those streams by roads and state highways and often those crossings are barriers to fish passage. Uh, Washington State DOT has been working since the early 1990s with Department of Fish and Wildlife and Tribes to identify fish passage barriers, uh, to prioritize those and to correct those with structures that freely pass fish under the highway. Uh, we've been working for a long time on that type of work and we've had good success with those projects. So this is one of the success stories of our barrier adjustments. 
Uh, we're standing on the edge of State Route 531, uh, where we used to have two uh, culverts running underneath the highway. Both of those culverts were barriers to fish. Then there was a historic fish weir between them that was also barrier to fish. Rather than shut down traffic here, we made the decision uh, it was best for the, the fish, the stream, as well as the traveling public to just move the entire stream outside the roadway. Um, we did that here about two years ago, and already this last fall we saw a significant number of returning fish um, that previously would have not been able to reach this point. They would have only been able to get just below our project site, and we have more than a mile of upstream gain that those fish can now go spawn in and rear their young. Tulalo Tribes has worked hard with, uh, with WashDOT to develop a strong working relationship with them. Uh, the goal is to help WashDOT succeed in implementing their fish passage program. Uh, we've already seen some, some fantastic successes with the program. We have fish coming back to areas where they were historically cut off, uh, fish rearing in areas where they didn't used to be able to, to spend time. And uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to continuing that working relationship and furthering the, the program. Partnerships are critical to the success of delivering WashDOT's Fish Passage program. And as the program continues to grow, the relationships with its program partners will play a substantial role as WashDOT moves forward, continuing to remove fish barriers. So that video is um, a couple years old, um, but it is available on our YouTube uh, channel if you want to watch it again and others as well. Um, so we have corrected 365 barriers since 1991, improving access to more than 1,200 miles of upstream habitat. The cartoon on your screen right now shows many of the reasons that a culvert is considered impassable. The water might be too fast, the pool in front of the culvert and the water running through it might be too shallow, or it's just too high for fish to successfully jump. The culverts on 202 and 203 have structures that are too small, too steep, and too shallow for successful fish migration. Replacing them with larger structures increases the likelihood that fish will migrate and spawn successfully. So now we're gonna show you where this work is going to occur. I'm going to start at the top of the map and work my way down. The orange dot at the top is on SR 203, just north of Northeast Carnation Farm Road. It carries an unnamed tributary to, or, or creek uh, to Horseshoe Lake. The dot in the middle on SR 203, south of Carnation, is an unnamed tributary to the Snoqualmie River near 324th Way Northeast. And then we have two culverts on SR 202. They're basically in the same location, southeast of Fall City. One carries Skunk Creek and the other carries an unnamed tributary to Skunk Creek. We're going to show you some photos of uh, the existing culverts now. Uh, this one that should be coming up on your screen shortly is the unnamed tributary to Skunk Creek that runs under SR 202. Due to its steep slope, it is considered completely impassable to the fish that use the stream. And the fish species include bull, resident trout, steelhead, and sea run cutthroat. This next one is an unnamed tributary to the Snoqualmie River emerging from under SR 203 near 324th Way Northeast, uh, which is south of Carnation. It's only 24 inches in diameter. And as you can see, the water is very shallow. This culvert is considered completely impassable to fish, which include coho, resident trout, steelhead, and sea run cutthroat. This next pipe carries the unnamed tributary to Horseshoe Lake under SR 203. It's also just 24 inches in diameter and rated as impassable. This creek is also used by coho, resident trout, steelhead, and sea run cutthroat. So now the question is, how do we fix them? with new structures that are bigger and better. This is a photo of a new culvert under SR202 near Sammamish. It carries Patterson Creek under the highway. And as you can see, this is a more welcoming environment with the addition of tree stumps that help slow the creek and create natural resting areas for fish. Here's an example next of a bridge that we built to carry Pussyfoot Creek under SR164 between Auburn and Enumclaw. We completed this bridge last year. Now, I can't be specific about whether the structures for SR202 and 203 are going to be bridges or large box culverts. That's because this project is being built under a design build contract, which means Washdot completes early design on the fish passage structures, but the selected contractor finishes the design, including the structure type 
and builds the structures at each location. We want to talk about traffic impacts now, and I want to caution you before I get into these highway closures. They are not finalized options. Construction techniques and efficiencies proposed by a design builder could result in fewer lane reductions and road closures, but this is based on what we know right now. Starting at the north end on SR203, the unnamed tributaries to Horseshoe Lake and Snoqualmie River we anticipate it may require a complete closure of the highway for 56 hours or about two and a half days. On 202 at Skunk Creek, there are a couple of potential options available. The work could be completed by reducing 202 to alternating traffic using a single lane for up to eight months, but the design builder could also look into building a short-term bypass route using Southeast Fish Hatchery Road. Now taking a look at our project timeline. Most of the rest of this year will be taken up with WashDOT and the design build contractor once they are selected, completing the design work. Something else to keep in mind is that this project is being combined into one big design build contract uh, with fish passage replacement projects in I-90 near Bellevue and SR-161 near Federal Way. So to accommodate all three of these locations, the construction window is quite lengthy. The earliest construction could start on 202 and 203 is 2023, but it could begin later than that. The design builder will set the schedule and decide which location to work first or whether to work on two or more at the same time. We are committed to keeping people updated on this project. And over the past couple of months, we've talked with local agencies, area tribes, and briefed local governments about this work. And as we get closer to construction and during construction itself, we'll provide regular project updates. And you can get those updates by signing up for our email newsletter or contacting the project team. So here are a couple of links that you can jot down and then type into your browser if you like. Um, and we're going to be adding them to chat. To visit the project webpage, which has contact information on it, go to bit.ly forward slash 202 and 203 fish. To receive updates for East King County projects, including this one, uh, when we have things to share, you can sign up for the newsletter by going to bit.ly forward slash WSDOT East King Co. Um, please note these are case sensitive. So while you copy those down, I do want to note that when we talk about projects and related highway closures, we can get very focused on the disruption of a construction project. And it's important that we come back to the purpose here, which is that we all have a role to play in fish recovery. We all benefit from strong, healthy ecosystems that support bringing back populations of fish species that have long been a cultural, economic, and even nutritional bedrock in the Pacific Northwest. This project has the potential to open more than 3.4 miles of waterways for fish habitat. And the return of natural stream conditions in these tributaries will boost spawning and rearing, which are vital steps to improving fish recovery rates. That concludes our presentation. So now we're gonna to turn to your questions and Kristen is going to moderate those for us. So Kristen, do you have anything available? I, I questions do. to start? Yeah, thanks. So one thing I did wanna address, um, I, we have a third grade teacher here who is asking for um, a link to the the video that we watched. And I know it's on the YouTube channel and I have been trying to communicate with our technical support to see if we can get that, that link and we'll hopefully by the end of the question and answer session, we'll put that link into the chat um, <clears throat> so you don't have to just search for it. It might be a little easier, but that's fun to think about some third graders watching that. Um, yes, we, and so we do have some other questions as well. Um, it looks like, you know, related to some traffic. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this one. It says that one of my concerns is that the section SR203 north of Carnation is the official evacuation route for Carnation if the Tolt Dam fails. Will the critical nature of this section of highway have a role in the design of the new structure? A structure with a relatively high seismic tolerance could be critical to the effective evacuation and life safety for Carnation. <clears throat> this is Tim now from WASDOT. 
Um, the exact details we do not have our bridge expert here, um, but we do uh, all our structures, depending on the size and length, uh, do have to meet seismic um, constraints. It's some of the tough constraints in the nation. So we will be meeting uh, seismic constraints. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, the, we have another question, and this is about 203 again. I have a business on 203 with large trucks. Does the open for freight apply to my trucks? We are with allowing trucks through and not completely closing. And because we have the 405, we have to allow trucks for 405 to come through here. Um, your big trucks will be able to get through. Except during, we do have the uh, two full closures, which will have a detour for them. Yeah, Tim, I wanted to add on to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. That um, 203 and 202, I believe, are both alternate routes for um, over height vehicles and trucks for 405. So it will, we are going to maintain through traffic. Um, including for trucks, except during those full weekend closures. Okay. Um, so let's see. So a couple more questions related to traffic impacts um, associated with construction. They're all a little different. So I'm going to go ahead and read them. Why is a full-time closure, the approximately 56 hour closure, not an option for the SR202 culvert, culvert replacement. With one-way traffic being the option for SR202, would this be only during construction hours or 24 hours or up to eight months? Well, we'll first start with the, <laughs> why we're not doing a full closure on a couple of these is because 405 has, uh, this is the bypass route for, um, oversized trucks and so they cannot use 405 so we have to leave this section one lane open at the one lane open so that trucks can get by um, the second part of the question what was that yes yeah, so it was with one-way traffic being the option for sr202 would this be only during construction hours or 24 hours for up to eight months? This will be a 24 hour uh, closure, a uh, single lane closure, because we are putting in a bridge, we're digging a big hole and filling it up uh, during, off, during uh, peak times or off hours mm -hmm. is not an option. So we have to leave, we're building one half of the bridge and having traffic on the other side, and then we switch sides. So it's, we do need to have it uh, closed 24 seven. Okay, thanks. Before I go to the next question, I just want to point out that um, the fish, the link to the fish passage video is now in the chat. So uh, what you do have to do have to click on it to see that um, and open that box. So enjoy. Um, let's see. Oh, we've got someone here saying, I'm very excited about this. I live off of two, SR202 and Skunk Creek runs through my property. The past season, we had a ton of fish every day migrating up. Some days we counted at least 50. Will they have only made it up to that culvert? If it's replaced, how far up the hill will they actually go? Um, Ellen, do you want to take that one or does Ruth? Hi, excuse me, I'm Ruth Park. I'm with the um, environmental group at WashDOT in this region. Um, I'm gonna look into that. I was trying to pull up the exact data around that, but I can give you a general answer um, <clears throat> that um, yes, that one is defined as a blockage. And so it would have been very difficult for fish to get upstream. Even when culverts are defined as 100% blockages, there are clever fish that are able to <laughs> work way upstream, um, but fixing it will make it a lot easier. And then I'll get back to you. I'll see if I can quick look. If not, we can follow up about the exact measure, but they would be able to go up until at least the next barrier, if there's another barrier in the system or to where there was some natural 
fish blockage. So, um, but I'll look up the exact details about that site. Thanks, Ruth. We, there are some questions about detours. So I'll just, I'll read this one. Have viable detour routes been identified for highway closures? I'll let Ellen, do you have some um, enlightenment for us on that one? Um, so the question was, uh, if there's, um, Sorry, could you restate that? that if there's viable, yeah. um, is, is, have viable detour routes been identified for highway closures? Yes. So when we developed um, when we developed these closures, we uh, made sure to evaluate and look and to make sure that um, that there are all all viable options. The um, the exact detour has not quite been decided, um, but since that will be um, later determined um, as the project moves forward, but it has been looked into that, that there are viable options available. Okay. And similar to that question, um, this is less a question, but it, it sounds like sort of a comment and a concern that routing oversized trucks to fish hatchery would seem to be a supremely poor choice. Um, so I just want to make sure we're you know documenting that comment here and that we've heard that. Thank you. When we talk about doing that we are talking about putting a basically making ship uh fish passage road 202 mm -hmm. and we'll have slip passages little little roads connecting them um the advantage to that is we get two lanes to work on instead of a single lane with traffic right next to the uh construction crews we get the full roadway to work on and a lot of our time is curing of concrete so if we're clearing half of it as opposed to curing the whole roadway it's still one time so this allowing us to work in two lanes at once considerably speeds up the construction hmm. and so that's why we'd like to shift it over onto basically onto um, fish hatchery road and then back um, it's just it's for uh, speed and for the safety because now we have a dis bigger distance between our construction crews and live traffic. And Kristen, I just wanted to, to clarify there as well. And um, so the using Southeast Fish Hatchery Road is is one of the options, you know, because they have a couple options at that location. So yes, um, a bypass is one of those. And I believe and I'm um, I haven't seen mm -hmm. the. Uh, the details in the in the request for proposal that we've already put out, um, but generally speaking, if we do shift traffic onto another roadway, um, the contractor is generally required to um, make sure that roadway um, stays in its existing condition, if you will. So if it if there are any breakdowns in it, potholes, for example, that form or anything like that, they would be required to 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 repair those. And in this situation, we're actually putting a bridge. We're having to deal with the fish passage on fish passage road too. So once we do 202, then we will be able to, we'll go over to fish passage, put in the bridge for the fish passage road and rebuild anything that did get damaged due to the time we were over what we had traffic on there. So it will be as good, if not better than what it was before uh, we were ever out there. Yeah, and that's Southeast Fish Hatchery Road. Yeah. And just to clarify, it's only a few hundred feet of Fish Hatchery Road, the, the part that's adjacent to 202. It's not the entire length of Fish Hatchery. Thanks, Conrad. By that. All right. Before we move on to a new question, there was a follow up question to a question that was a couple questions ago related to the 24 hour closure. Um, and if it, so the question is the 24 hour question related to one way traffic for SR202, is that the same for S, does it apply to SR203 site as well? No, because that one we do have, um, we do have detours that are, that of course have not been finalized yet, but that are viable. And so that one we're better we're better off instead of spending um, 120 240 days out there 
with alternating traffic, 120 in each direction, we can get that done in 56 hours. So it's a considerably um, time saver, less impact to the general public, to the traveling public, it's a, and, and it's safer. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question about if as the sites on 202 and 203 projects will be constructed at the same time. This, this is a uh, question that when we get a contractor design builder on board, that is one of the things they, depending on how many, what their crews they have, how many crews they have, um, where they're working, these are choices that they can make. Um, we will, they will be proposing it to our construction coordination office and they have final say on how much of an impact um, this will have, but for the, uh, 202 sections, we imagine both those, but we won't have both 202 and 203 at the same time, because that would be um, troublesome with the, with the detours. Okay. And related to those closures, there's a question, um, this, this person mentioned they were a little late to the meeting. Is there wondering if there's a more detailed schedule of when SR202 will be one lane? With that, as we met, mentioned, this is also combined with a uh, couple other locations, I-90, um, mm -hmm. just east of 405, also SR-161 in the, um, down by Wildways. The whole project is about four years long to do mm -hmm. all these locations. When the contractor gets on board, they will create a schedule determining on where they're going to work um, if they're going to work at two locations at once, all this stuff will be determined by the design builder, depending on their crews, the equipment they have, um, and what other projects, because we have a lot of projects, and when they're doing work, we have to coordinate with them also. So this all will be determined uh, probably early in 2023. Okay. And again, related, I'm jumping around in the questions as they come in, because this is also about the timing. And I know you said you can't say for sure, but there is a, a question here that says, do you have dates for the closures and can be, they be outside of the school year as there are a lot of school bus routes that will be in, you know, affected by these closures? Um, let's take the easy one. The 56 hour one is the, will be most likely during the summer because we do have a fish window, which is where, the fish are not flowing in the in the stream. And this is where we can actually work inside the water. In the 56 hour closure, we'll most likely be in that time frame. Um, so that will be outside, that'll be July, August, September time. Um, and so that one will most likely be outside. The other two where they're 120 days long, and they're actually working on a bridge, which they can work on the bridge without opening up the culvert itself, which means they're not in the fish. They're not in the fish window. Those can be done almost all year round. So those, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Um, Kristen, I think what, just to kind of address that bigger question about schedules, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we we in the contract will generally um, will generally put some some limitations on it. We are limited, for example, by the fish window when contractors are allowed to work in water, which is usually July, August, September, depending on the stream. Mm -hmm. um, overall, however, the, the 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 schedule and when dates of closures will occur, et cetera, um, that will be set by the contractor. Um, or they'll submit a schedule rather to us and then we'll, we'll review it. But once we have that, we'll have a better idea of how they plan to execute their work and when those, when those closures will likely begin and end. But until that happens, um, until we have that contractor on board and they create that schedule, we won't be able to say, here's when it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to also add that we will be contacting essential services um, fire department, uh, police department, and school districts to so that they know that this is coming. Um, mm -hmm. Anywhere from 30 days, well, to, if we know for sure in the beginning, we'll give them a heads up. 
um, as we get closer, we'll give them more confirmed dates of when these 120 day uh, alternating uh, traffic closures, 120 times two, so four, 240 days, and when the 56 hour closer, we will be working with the school districts too, so that they understand uh, when it's gonna happen. Also, if there's some reason that we shouldn't be doing it, we will have that dialogue with the different essential services. And we had a meeting with um, the essentials, a lot of essential services out in that particular area on April. I'm looking at my schedule up back on yeah. April 11th to give mm -hmm. them um, a heads up about this and talk about the potential closures and everything. So we've already started those conversations. And Chris, for someone who may have joined late, uh, and since we're talking about schedule, there's a question about if construction information will be put on the website um, and, and sort of how else people will be notified. So there's there's a couple different different ways. The, the website is going to be um, the most immediately available and probably the most up to date. We also will put um, closure information, particularly when it comes to the big closures, when big things are going to start. Um, we'll do a combination of news releases Facebook posts, um, Twitter, um, I'm trying to think what else, um, our, our watch.email yeah. newsletter. Um, we've also been in contact out there with a quite popular, and I'm trying to remember his name right now, but he runs like a traffic account for that particular area. Um, and I've already been in touch with him. So it'll be available in, in multiple, multiple ways. Um, before we get too much farther into, before we take the next question, I do want to follow up earlier. Someone asked about um, the fish going up the stream and Ruth had answered that. And she put a little note for us in here because she's got some information about it. Um, and it was about 202 Skunk Creek. And once we remove our, the, the culvert that's there and put in a new fish passage, she says um, it has 2,659 meters of upstream, upstream gain that will be fully accessible to migrating fish after the repair. There are no human made upstream barriers. So there's lots of new area for fish to spawn and rear. Great, thanks for that Ruth and Chris. So there are a few questions about other projects in the area, but again, they're all a little different. So I'll, I'll read them. Uh, the first one, there are other culverts on 203 near there, the, these locations that become clogged and cause flooding upstream. Will those ever be redesigned? Um, that is on a case by case culverts. I, I, we'd have to look at each individual case. Um, whether or not it is a fish passage um, block or is it not. Um, it could be a maintenance, only a maintenance issue. Then we need to be talking to our maintenance crew. Um, again, without knowing the exact culvert, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. The other thing to keep in mind is a lot of those culverts, they may not be owned by WashDOT. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're not WashDOT owned, um, we can't fix them. So we have to concentrate on, our, on the state owned culverts that are running under state roads. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I'm looking, it looked like there was a follow-up question when we were talking about Fish Hatchery Road. Um, and the question is, so you will reopen Fish Hatchery Road again along the river? Does that? Along the river. I will be like, uh, it'll be just a small little section that we'll be using basically where it gets really close to 202. Um, and yeah, it will be reopened um, at the end of our construction once we have rebuilt both the 202 and the Fish Hatchery Road culvert, uh, put the um, 202, 202 and Fish Hatchery uh, bridges, sorry. I think the question might be about, you know, you know Fish Hatchery Road today is closed. It doesn't go through. There, there's a county owned bridge that's that's been closed. And, and so our, our detour that we're talking about, our, our shoe fly bypasses is not the entire length of Fish Hatchery Road. It's only that portion where it's right next to 202. So no more than 500 feet in length. And, and so no, we are not planning to open the Fish Hatchery Road uh, east of the project or south of the project that's that's owned by the county. Kristen, I think in our, don't we in our, in 
toward the end of our of our presentation, we had a couple pictures that showed street level views of the locations. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm wondering so if we, we might be able to bring that that up so we can show the, the street level location where Southeast Fish Hatchery Road is. Yeah, Rosalind, if you could pull up the presentation again and go to those sort of post presentation that might, slides. Yeah, that and while she's pulling that up, sometimes PowerPoint takes a minute. Oh, that was fast. Maybe it will load more quickly than I realized. And then um, if you just, why don't you just, yeah, and please go ahead and pot. Is this the one you were thinking about or? I thought there was a street level one there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oops, go back. Go back one, yep. I'm pretty, that's Yeah, so our, our portion of Fish Hatchery Road that we would use is just that portion that's shown in the picture. We would not be going down by Snoqualmie River um, and, and the dirt road down there, gravel road. That's, that will not be a detour. Just, just right here, as shown. And I'll, since we have this up, and please leave this up just for a minute, because this is a question I think that's related. Um, it says maybe they could replace the fish hatchery bridge at the same time. Is that? Yeah, that, that's owned by King County and, and not a part of this project, unfortunately. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I wanted to get that answered. Um, and let's see. So regard, here's an, here, another question, that, moving on a little bit. Regarding 202, there's a fish hatchery not far upstream. What's the relationship of this to the work you plan? Is something else or more really needed for fish migration? I'm not quite sure. Oh, Ruth, do you want to try that? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, Ruth, I saw Ruth get on, so that's a Ruth question. I can give it a go. Um, so the fish hatchery work is essentially unrelated to the work that we're doing. Our charge is to replace our barriers. So, you know, essentially there's barriers to fish migration. It's blocking habitat, and we're, we're removing those blockages to habitat so that fish can freely move up and down the stream. Thank you, Ruth. So why don't, um, Rosalind, why don't you leave this up for a minute? Because I think there is another question that we might want one of these images to answer. Um, let me just make sure. Oh, okay, maybe not. Okay, yeah, I guess not. Um, there, there was a question if there are other anticipated fish projects being considered for these stretches of 202 and 203? Um, that is a, I mean, what, what is the, the limit? Um, we have a lot of fish pass culverts that need to be, fish passage block culverts that need to be replaced. Um, we're working hard, uh, uh, working hard on them. We have done some already in this area, uh, Evans Creek. Um, I'm trying to remember other ones. Conrad has better memory on that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, Patterson Creek and some unnamed tributaries to Patterson. Uh, I know we're working on another one, Smamish Creek. Um, and then I will put in the chat, um, we, have a, we have a GIS map here that shows all of Washtenaw owned barriers, ones that have been corrected, ones that have been that are planned for projects and ones that we are not addressing. Um, so that's that's in the chat. Um, also a helpful one is the Department of Fish and Wildlife GIS map. You can see all of the barriers, not not just the washdot owned ones. So that one is is also in the chat for you. And I can just add on to that a little bit. Those are great links. Thanks, Conrad. The way that um, washdot has prioritized our work generally is by most habitat first. So the sites that have more of that upstream gain are being built first. And so that's why some those 202 Patterson ones and unnamed were already built. And then these ones have still a lot of habitat and there's ones with less that'll come later. But we have a, a goal by 2030 to open up 90% of the habitat. And so to do that, the, the strategy is to hit the ones with more habitat first. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ruth and Conrad. So um, we might need that PowerPoint back up, Roslyn. Um, someone is a little, con 
is it say, and the question is, doesn't Skunk Creek come down the hill under the airport and to the river? What is the unnamed tributary on your PowerPoint? So um, does that, should we ask for more clarification on that question or is um, that? I think the, the plan view might be better to show if you go back okay. one slide. Yeah. So maybe yeah. back one slide? Back, I think? back probably to the map. Oh. Yep, or, right there. Or go, yeah. No, we're looking at um, fish. which which one? I thought it says skunk. So doesn't Skunk Creek come down the hill under the airport and to the river? What is the unnamed tributary on your PowerPoint? Yeah, if you go back to the plan on the of Skunk Creek. So that was uh, in the in the earlier in the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Oh, or was it? I forget. We um, didn't have the plan. We just had the we just had the map with the locations. Okay. The unnamed tributary is really, really close to the Skunk Creek. Um I can't remember how far apart are they, Ellen? It's a couple hundred feet all it is. Um and yeah, they're basically right next to each other. Yeah, they're basically right next to each other. And instead of having two crossings, we're just gonna merge them into one and bring them across because they they do merge together just on the south east side, southwest side of 202. So it's they come together fairly close. The ending tributaries um, catchment area or the how far up it, it's a fairly small creek. It doesn't, it's not that long. And so that's why it's being uh, combined with the Skunk Creek tributary. Um, does that answer the question? Hopefully. If, if that didn't, please let us know. I, I'm following the Q&A and, and we can follow up again. Um, but for now, I will move on to another question. If the alternate route on Fish Hatchery Road is not utilized by the contractor, does the RFP require the contractor to provide two-way traffic on SR202 after working hours? when only one-way traffic would be provided? No, it would be, again, we'll have a, it will be the way we would build it if we weren't using Fish Hatchy Road is that we build half of the bridge on 202 with the other half of the roadway having alternating traffic. When we're, and then we switch it to build the other half of the road. When we're building this bridge, we will have a substantial hole that we can't fill up after hours and we're talking weeks of work doing doing this we also when we pour the deck we have to be off of it we can't we have a few weeks where we can't have any traffic on there even the contractors trucks why the concrete cures again we can't have the general traffic so we only have one lane uh, available and that would be we require us to go alternating traffic 24 7 during those well, be 120 in each each side, so 240 days total. Okay, and um, I, th there was a second part to that question. Um, sorry, I just lost it about. Um, yeah, or would would one way traffic? Maybe you answer this, or would one-way traffic on SR202 be provided 24 hours a day for the duration of the project? I was trying to give you that in two parts and maybe I should have read them. Well, duration of the project, no, there's no, well, they, they have 240 days total that they can have alternating traffic at mm -hmm. both those locations. Uh, there's 240 days that they can have alternating traffic. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of other work that will not be impacting the traffic, um, excavating under the bridge, getting the stream bed correct, um, preliminary stuff for uh, clearing and grubbing, uh, uh, clearing trees and getting the roadway prepared. All that stuff will be done off, not during these uh, alternating lane closures. There will be some nighttime closures um, that are allowed, but very limited hours during the night. And by the morning commute, they'll be the lane will be open. That's outside of these 240 hours, 240 mm -hmm. days of alternating traffic. Thanks. And while this slide is up, I think I'll say there, it looks like someone 
um, joined us late and, you know, was just curious about the location of the closures. They must have joined when we were talking about closures. And, and so while this map is up, that gives you a rough idea of where these project sites are and where there will be traffic impacts. And um, just to say that there'll be more details about those traffic impacts later. Yeah, and, and Kristen, because, you know, this, this particular map is not super detailed. Right. Um, I can, I can review where, where those, what are the um, closest cross streets, if you will. So you can see the, the top one, um, which is um, the tributary or uh, to Horseshoe Lake. That's, um, let me see, I say just north of Northeast Carnation Farm Road. Mm -hmm. The one in the middle um, is a tributary to the Snoqualmie River, and that's near 324th Way Northeast. And then the two that are southeast of Falls City, um, which as we, Ellen earlier said, they're only, you know, maybe a couple hundred feet apart. Um, that's one of them is Skunk Creek and the other one is an unnamed tributary to Skunk Creek. Okay, thank you, Chris. So this question, I, I think was a follow up when we were talking about um, unnamed tributary near Skunk Creek. The, the question is, what about Mud Creek, which is a few hundred feet east of Skunk crossing 202? Mud um, Creek is another project that mm -hmm. will be coming to my office eventually. Um, and right now we're working on how we're going to work with that one. That one has a lot of complexities. We originally had it in this project, but due to the complexities, the coordination with the King County and because they have a culvert there that also needs to be re, uh, replaced, we're going to do it as we're trying to do it as one project. Um, so yeah, we are looking at Mud Creek and it will be one uh, in the near future. Thanks, Tim. All right, another question. Um, so this is a two or three in one. I'm, I'll read the full thing as they're related and then we can I can always reread it. Um, does the culvert project under SR202 also extend under the county's fish hatchery road to the south? within the 500 foot section of Fish Hatchery Road? If not, yes. is this, okay, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, great, hang on, there's more to this question. If not, is there fish passage blockage under Fish Hatchery Road? So um, immediately downstream, it sounds like that gun was driven the first, yeah. On the first part, yes, um, yeah. it's actually one culvert underneath both. Mm -hmm. uh, 202 and Fish Hatchery Road. And since it's one culvert, we're even though the Fish Hatchery Road is a county road, we can we can fund and pay for the full replacement of both both uh places. So it's one culvert. What was now what was the second part of the question? Oh, I, I wanted to clarify that. Um there are gonna be all three different structures, but it's one crossing. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And then that finally, do you have a graphic that can be shared to illustrate the extents of the culvert replacement project at the SR202 location? Um, yeah, we have contract documents available on our website and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, a lot of legal stuff in there, but if, if you go to the appendix section, um, there's some good graphics in there. Mm -hmm. And if you have any trouble with that, um, finding those. Um, Chris's contact information is on the web page, right? You can help that person locate it, thank you. Um, and let's see, for one lane on, on 202, will you use the same stoplight system they used on 203 towards Duval when they fixed the road? That is, um with the contractor needs to develop a uh, managed a traffic management plan and these are questions that he will develop he could put flaggers out there 24 7 he could put in a alternating um try not to use technical term this uh light system like they did up farther up the road mm -hmm. um it all depends on the contractor and what he has 
what he puts into this traffic management plan that needs to get approved by WSDOT and the county because some of this uh, affects the county too. So they will be looking at this traffic management plan. Okay, thank you. Um, so that is, that was our last question. I, you know, I will, we'll pause here for a minute to make sure there aren't some other questions. Oh, one just popped up. Um, will wash dot add a link to the preliminary drawings? Oh, to the project web page. Um, meaning the information made available to contractors via the RFP. Will that be on the project web page? Um, generally, those are not put on the, the project page because they're they're so usually detailed and complicated mm -hmm. that they don't translate well to um, the project page to just putting a smaller version on it. Um, so what I can do is is link to the, the contract page. Um, mm -hmm. So let me let me think about that one because I know that sometimes and, and they're, they're usually really technical sometimes and kind of hard to understand. So that's why I'm always hesitant to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we can do something that's um, sort of maybe I can get our graphics department to do something that kind of gives a conceptual version. Mm -hmm. Look at look to it or something like that. Since okay, we don't yeah, know what the um, final that, des design will actually look like. Right. And that was part sort of part of that question if if now or further along in design if it's not those technical drawings if there's something that will give yeah. people a better sense of what that's going to look like on the land mm -hmm. yeah um all right um so that's there are no more questions that you know good timing it's about 12 52 um but i thought i would pa i'll pause for a minute um and Yes, another question came in. If you intend to use Fish Hatchery Road where you showed in your picture, where is it nearly tangent to 202? Where do you intend to re-enter 202? Um, at, because our, our culverts in the, in the our, you know, we'll probably only need a hundred feet for construction, 150 feet, don't hold me to that, but somewhere around there. So in that picture, what you saw is going to be a, the pretty much the limits of what we this uh, use of uh, Fish Hatchery Road will be can, just in that can picture. We, can we bring up that picture again? It's a relatively short section that we'll be using. So basically, if I understand this, because I'm not a I'm not a, an engineer, which kind of helps. So um, we need the, probably the next picture yeah. that shows the street level. Yeah, that right one. Yeah. Um, so my understanding, Tim, from from someone who, like I said, is not an engineer, is that we would probably remove part of this guardrail, or maybe some of it. Right. Quite a bit of it. Yeah. Quite a bit of it. We put some pavement down to connect the two roads. Correct. Or like a sort of like a, a little driveway from one to the other, if you will. And take them around to the other side of the of the of the culvert farther down the road there, where you'd have another um, section of pavement to reconnect. About the place where the intersection comes in. Yeah. So that's what we mean by by a bypass. Just a small little bypass. Um, and then the Fish Hatchery Road will also have some improvement done to it so as to make it so that they can have left and turns onto 202, onto 202. And then, um, so there's some, there will be work to make sure that it will be a safe situation. Um, yeah, we're not talking hard right and hard left turns on and off 202 there. No. Um, but but that's kind of a, from, from a sense of how, how we would just, we just you put some pavement, you know, take out that guardrail and then and create essentially a ramp from ramp from one to the other. Correct. I hope that answers the, the question. I think so. I'm, I'm trying to track it here. Um, yeah. 
All right, well, I think that ends our question and answer session. Thank you everyone for a really lively conversation. Lots of good questions. And Chris, I'll hand it off to you to close us out today. Yeah, I just also wanted to say just thank you everyone for participating today. Um, this is the first time we've done a kind of a lunch and learn like this. So I was glad to see people um, joining in and participating and asking some really great, great questions. We'll be um, continuing to stay in touch with the community out there um, as we get closer to construction. Um, and I also want to remind you that a recording of this is going to be available um, on our project webpage. Um, so that if you want to watch it again or you want to pass it off to somebody to watch, you're certainly welcome to do that. So we thank you again so much for your time and, and staying here with us um, and, and asking us some great questions and, and appreciate it. Um, and I, I might just quick add, because a lot of great information was added to the chat for people that will just stay here for a minute or two if you um, all want to open the chat and copy any of those direct links. Um, in case you didn't have a chance to do that during the presentation, um, we'll just pause here for a minute. And just if you're having any issues, again, just click on that chat and a box should open and some of those links will be in there. And I'm also going to add, based on the, some of the, the Q&A that we got today and some of the, the stuff we, you know, how we answered, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to hear what, what people in the community are thinking about. So I'm going to take that information back and see what I can do to provide additional information and clarity um, on our website based on the project website based on the questions and, and stuff that people asked today. So okay. Well thank you everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.